Hi, I'm Lise Colucci, and I'm a life coach at queenbeing.com, where we help you to discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse in toxic relationships. Hello and welcome. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about how to stay safe, How 10 ways to reduce your vulnerability to a narcissistic person or to a toxic person in your life. 10 ways to keep you safe that you can take control of and you can begin to make changes if you need to or at least look at so that you yourself have the power to create a life that is free from toxic people as best you can. So, or if you have them in your life that you can't be free for them, ways to um, improve your own life so that they don't affect you quite so much. So let's get talking about that. Um, number one is um, know what it is that you want for your life. So if you know what it is, what the direction you want to take your life, what it is that you want for your life, like say you've been discarded and you're healing and you're trying to create a life for yourself, start to pay attention to what it is you want for your life. Your, what are your hopes, your dreams? What do you want? Start creating that life by doing the things you want to do and making a life for yourself that is one that serves the benefit of what you want for your life. And as you do that, only allow people in who are positive and have an influence that is like positive and growth oriented toward that, toward that aim, where it's like a mutually beneficial type of friendship or relationship so that you are helping each other to grow and, um, you know, live the lives that you want to live in a positive way. So in other words, keep the negative people out. For two, self-esteem. Start to figure out where you need some work in that area and get busy. We all have varying levels and degrees of self-esteem, of course. Um, but the thing is, that a narcissist or a toxic person will prey upon anyone with low self-esteem. They will build you up in order to knock you back down lower than you were before you met them. So self-esteem is critical. You got to build yourself up and, and only you, it's self-esteem. You are the one in charge of creating what you believe about yourself. Okay. You can get help, of course. And that's what we're here for working on things like um, paying attention to the way you talk to yourself, paying attention to the beliefs you have about yourself. And if they're not ones that go back to number one, serving what you want for your life, if they're not beliefs that you have that will help you get where you want to be, then change them. Beliefs can be changed. Beliefs were put there. They were programmed into you and they can be changed. It's not a simple process, of course. And, you know, finding help. This is one thing that I will say that all of this stuff that I'm talking about today is a place where coaching can really help because it can help to have somebody basically cheering you on and got helping to you to discover what it is about yourself, um, ways to change your perspective, right? Ways to open up instead of seeing things in the little box that you see things in, ways to widen that perspective so that you can see things differently and then make the changes that you need to make. Um, but doing it on your own, there's plenty of workbooks and um, books out there and questions to ask here if you don't know. So we'll go on from the self-esteem. But that's a really, really, really important one is building up your self-esteem. A narcissist always preys on low self-esteem. They love it. That's that's like the prime target is someone that doesn't have... Um, well, they also like to try and break people who have high self-esteem. But, but really, if your self-esteem is low and it combines with a lot of these other things and many other things besides these 10, then um, it makes you completely vulnerable to somebody coming in and building you up so that then they can tear you down. In fact, you have to do it for yourself, even if you're around healthy people, right? Number three, are you love addicted? <laughs> yeah, I got to check that one. I'm going to just say briefly on this because that's a whole topic all in itself, right? Do you need to feel loved? by someone else in order to feel your own worth? Do you need to, um, do you overlook things because you just want what they're giving you? And so it doesn't matter if they do X, Y, Z, as long as they give you attention. Is the attention what feeds you versus the communication and the connection with another person? You know, if you're with someone and you're, so drawn to the energy of them giving you attention, 
there's a likelihood that that, I mean, everybody likes attention. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to want some attention, but when that's the thing that drives the relationship, there's something in there that's out of balance. Okay. It should, a healthy exchange between two people is the connection in the way the two people communicate and the give and take, right? Number four, boundaries. We know this, right? We know that the narcissistic person will push boundaries, no matter what, they always push boundaries, they push boundaries, they step on boundaries, they completely decimate boundaries, they, they push the line further and further back until you've lost your moral, your own moral compass half the time, and your own self worth gets, you know, thrown into the ground, because you're not living the life you want to live or the life you, you believe you should live. So it's not only learning to set those boundaries, it's learning to hold and keep those boundaries as something that is true, to, so true to you that you won't let anyone cross it. And sometimes we get a little over the top and a little rigid and like boundary happy. That can happen. It's okay. But finding a, a balance of being able to push your limits, like in other words, if sometimes we have to push our boundaries a little, does that make sense in order to grow? And other times we have to know, no, that's a hard line. So it's learning all about your boundaries with all the different kinds of boundaries and 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 understanding how to how to work with them so that it's not just, oh, I'm placing a boundary. Let's see if this person crosses it. It's not foreign to you. It's totally part of how you operate. It's not going to keep the narcs out, but it certainly won't let them. They'll get bored. If they don't know you very well, they'll move on to a new target, most likely, unless it's a challenge. You know, it just depends on the type. But it's all these things put together, right? Or people pleasing. We got to stop the people pleasing, right? That's not it, being a peep, being helpful and giving to other people is great. That's fine. But when it's people pleasing, what does that mean? What does that mean where it's different? To me, it means where it's unhealthy for a person to be a people pleaser is where we're trying to gain our self worth through what we do for other people. Of course, doing things for other people makes us feel good. That's that's healthy and natural and normal. But it's when that's where we're going in order to gain any form of self-esteem and self-worth. What happens is everyone uses you. Even nice people use you. You will find your friends using you who are kind people. And they don't even mean it. It's just that we set ourselves up through all the pleasing to never take back, right? To never have things given back to us. So... If we're people pleasing all the time and we're not asking for help and we're not asking, we're not, there's no reciprocation in your life, then something's out of balance. And that's where you can like look at it and say, okay, it's okay that I want to help and please people. I have to be very specific on who I help, who I help and who I'm trying to make life easier or whatever for. But I need to have something coming back in another direction from each person that I'm giving to. It has to be reciprocal because when you're, um, it all affects your self-worth. Self-trust. This is an interesting one because how do you do it? I think I talked about it a couple weeks ago, but really in a nutshell, um, what is it? I mean that paying attention to what's going on in front of you and believing it as what it is. Sometimes we don't realize, we see a shark and we think it's not a shark. So when you're talking about dealing with people, and um, potentially abusive, toxic people. Often, what I hear over and over, and what I, you know, experienced is that we don't um, we spend a lot of time justifying behaviors of other people in order to squeeze all these other things we talked about into our life, in order to feel like our self esteem is being built up, in order to, you know, please someone else, in order to stop, in order to not make waves. We've been taught and programmed to hide from what we're seeing, justify what we're seeing as something else. And what that does is it messes up your ability to trust yourself, totally messes up your ability because you know better. It's like, you know, what's in front of you. It's a shark and I'm going to stick my hand in that tank anyway, because it's not really a shark. I can pet it as long as I pet it just right. And I don't, you know, do anything to really disturb it. It'll be okay. It's not really a shark, but really it is. And we have to face what's in front of us and take it at face value. And sometimes um, that can be really hard. I think it can create a hypervigilance when we come out of abuse where we think everyone is toxic and we think all things that don't go our way are out are against us instead of actually being just something that's messed up in the moment. You know, like we take everything personal and that it's 
it, it creates a hypervigilance when we don't trust ourselves because, and, and, and we can see why we've learned not to trust ourselves. So, I mean, it makes sense, but it's also a place to work to start to gain some self-trust so that you can see things more, a little more objectively and also more truthfully for it is what it is and not trying to fit someone into a mold. When you're talking about like meeting a new person, like say you're out and you make a new friend or someone you're going to date or whatever, and you're kind of watching for red flags and you're, you know, doing the thing we do with your hypervigilance is on high, you're not going to see them. Okay. Or if you're still in, in a, in a state of total lack of self-trust where you justify behaviors, then you're not going to see it. So it's really like learning. So we'll go more about that. So number um, six goes right with it, which is trusting your intuition, trusting your intuition. What's your gut telling you? What are you feeling in your body? And most people that are a lot of people are pretty empathic who have been with narcissists. And what we can learn is that um, the way we experience other people, the feelings we have, the anxieties that are created, or the calm that's created is directly related sometimes to that other person. Not that other people control what we think or feel, but we definitely pick up the vibe or we pick up a feeling, right, from other people. And you learn to trust that in combination with what your brain is telling you, what your logic is seeing, and it builds self-trust and intuition trust. Raise your standards for how you will be treated. Raise your standards. We have really low standards sometimes about, it kind of comes back to the justifying and the not wanting to see what's right in front of us, but your standards for how you will be treated, what are they? Respectfully, kind, I mean, list them, you guys. What 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 are some standards you have? Or do you even think about it? You know, sometimes we just let people be who they are. Of course, we need to, but at the same time, we don't have a gauge for what we expect for our life. And it kind of comes back to the first one, which is knowing what you want for your life, but raising your standards for how you will be treated, especially if you're entering into a dating relationship or you're considering that, is um, I think it goes hand in hand with red flags but raising how the expectation of how you will be treated for the, for your life, because what you're looking at when you're looking at dating in particular, isn't, is this person safe to hang out with for a few hours? It is that too. But I mean, what we're looking at is long-term. Is this person actually um, good for another person's life? <laughs> Are they good for me? Are they good for my life? Right. And how can you know if you don't have if you don't even know what your standards are? So look at what your standards are and raise the bar a little bit. You don't have to make it like out of control, you know, impossible to meet, but raise the bar. And at the same time, lower your tolerance for what you will tolerate. So a lot of us can take a lot because we're people pleasers, we're fixers, we're um, we're interested in other people. We know we see the good in people. We know that we can tolerate somebody's mood, so to speak. Um, it, but really, if you'll start to look at that and realize how much you tolerate that is not necessarily yours to fix or yours to deal with, it's somebody else's that they need to get a hold of and and take care of before they are healthy for some other person, if they even can, if they're a narcissist, they can't. But you know, so lowering your tolerance goes hand in hand with raising your standard red flags. That's where we still have to look at them and be concerned about what they're doing. If you notice everything else is about you, because that's how I roll, at least, you know, uh, being in control of yourself and your own power to change, right? If we put the power to change in someone else's hands, it's not going to happen very likely, right? Okay, so red flags. We got to learn about those red flags and pay attention. Again, self-trust and looking at them for what they are. What we need to form with the red flags is a big picture of who that other person is as quickly as we can and as um, honest with ourselves and the situation as we can. Um, Jonas is very critical of others. And hello, Laura. Uh, she says being extremely secretive, uh, sharing way too much too soon. Yes, um, love bombing, um, future faking, catching someone in a lie, um, secrecy that seems not sharing enough information about oneself, but at the same time, um, 
almost like they're creating a facade of what they want you to see. Does that make sense? My ex is crazy. That kind of, you know, talking about talking negatively about other people, treating other people a little bit rudely, not rudely enough where you go where it startles you, but just like not real friendly with the wait staff is one phrase people use a lot. You know what I mean? Like not real engaging with other people where you, it shows what you're looking for really is lack of empathy. You're looking for the biggest one, which is that person has no empathy. And the only way to see that is to look at a whole lot, you know, a broad spectrum of things. And, and a lot of it isn't necessarily how they treat you. It can also be how they are treating other people in their life, what they say about their friends, how they talk about if you listen to someone talk, tell a story, and they're talking about how so and so related to so and so and how this went down, and you listen to how judgmental they are, and how they critique and criticize or put down one over the other, or like just listening, you just pay attention and you pay you understand your intuition and what you're, what you're getting from it. And you look for the self-trust things we talked about, and it can kind of help. Um, the look, the eye contact, the stare, that's a big old red flag. Somebody so intensely staring at you that you feel pulled toward them or repulsed, you know, being repelled away from them because they are using their, their stare as a, as a hook to pull you in. So that's another one. Those are a few to look for. And learning to believe that they are what they are. This is the thing with red flags in any of this, when we're talking about seeing another person is we have to accept no matter how cute, no matter how charming, no matter how whatever, when a red flag is a red flag, end of sentence. It goes back to your boundaries and back to your, you know, what do you want for your life? So that it all goes together, right? so that you believe those red flags and you act on them, you step away. Number eight, learning to enjoy alone time, learning to enjoy your own company and learning to spend time and doing, spending time doing things that you enjoy by yourself. What happens when you do that? And even if you're a person that lives a pretty solitary life and you are and you think, oh, I'm doing all this stuff by myself, whatever, and this isn't helping, are you enjoying it? Are you learning to see the beauty of who you are and laugh at yourself? I mean, do you walk around and like think things and actually start laughing as if you're with a friend? That's the kind of life. If you can create that, the people that want into that are usually good people because they do it too, right? And people, narcs will try and steal it, of course. They want they want they want the light that you're emanating when you're like that. But then when you have all the other things in place, you know, it, it, this all goes together. I and mean, when I thought about this, I tried to piece it together. 10 things that, I mean, minimally 10 things that could uh, together work as a, like a toolkit for your own safety and creating a life that's better for yourself. So um, spending time alone, um, it, it's not just once in a while, you got to do it enough kind of regularly so that you, so it becomes part of um, your experience of yourself. And when you learn to actually experience yourself and see who you are and be completely authentic within yourself without judgment and without a lot of self-criticism or any of that, you just learn to be your own friend. It's like nothing else. I can't, I can't explain that. But um, that's a place where what happens is no one gets to challenge that space. No one gets to tell you that that person isn't worth anything because you know, you know, from experience that you're worth something, not just a belief or a thought or an affirmation, but you've truly experienced walking along some trail and cracking up at some thought in your head without judgment or whatever it is that makes you um, see your own value, whatever things really feeling I'm a good person. This is good. I'm okay. I really enjoy this. When I'm by myself, I feel at home, that kind of thing. When you can get to that space, even little bits at a time, the only way I know to do it is just start doing it. Start spending time alone and dropping the judgment. If you feel the judgment come in, just say, you know what, not now. Right now, I'm just learning who, who this person is. When we judge ourselves, we don't see ourselves. What we're doing is putting programming on top of the experience of ourself and not actually seeing ourselves. Just like when we judge someone else, we're not seeing them. We can judge their actions if they're, you know, if they're judgeable actions where they're actually being toxic. That's different. I'm not talking, that's not even judging. That's just calling it, 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 it is what it is. Right. And when we are judging ourselves, we're not seeing ourselves in an, it is what it is kind of way. We're seeing ourselves in a, 
a valuing system that's comparing ourselves to something we think we should be. Anyway, so getting rid of all that and just spending time with yourself in a positive way, doing something you enjoy, getting out of your own head, so to speak, so that you can see who you really are, that creates a person who sees that no one gets to devalue that. And if they do, they're gone. They're not worth it. Not, not five minutes. Does that make sense? Number 10 is take your time. Don't be rushed for any of this. This isn't like, you know, let's make our life better in a day kind of stuff. Take your time with yourself and be patient, but also take your time when you're getting to know someone new, because this whole thing was about, you know, ways to protect yourself from narcissists in the future. Take your time to get to know a person for who they are. Step back from what you want from that person. In other words, especially if it's a dating situation and you have the rush and the excitement and the and the nervousness and the anxiety and the whatever else comes up, if it's positive and if it's negative, you have all the other stuff. Take your time to be a, a witness to what's happening instead of falling into it emotionally it's too fast, okay? Yeah, taking your time for yourself to healing and then when you meet new people to really see who they are so that you aren't rushing in and forgetting all this other stuff. That's the fastest way for someone to push your boundaries is if you let yourself go into what you think you want from the situation before you even know who the person is. Okay, so let's move on here. Um, and I'm going to read some of this. So thank you all for joining me today. I appreciate you being here. And as always, I wish you well on your healing journey. And hit subscribe if you enjoyed this. And hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Take care, you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>